Hi everybody, welcome to a general overview of photosynthesis and cell respiration. First, we're gonna get into photosynthesis. So you should know some of this already. You should know that photosynthesis takes place in plant cells only, and it occurs in an organelle called the chloroplast. It uses energy from the sun, and then that helps convert water and carbon dioxide into oxygen and glucose, which the plant uses. The formula is below, so H2O plus CO2 yields with sunlight above, O2, and then C6H12O6, which you need to memorize is glucose. Honestly, you need to memorize the whole formula. Just file that away for later. So let's to get into the chloroplast just a little bit more. So first of all, why is the chloroplast even green? Well, a chloroplast absorbs green light and as a result reflects blue and red. There's three important structures you need to be aware of on the chloroplast. So the first one is the thylakoid. So this is where the light strikes. This is where the chlorophyll is. And it's just one of these little discs you see here. So that is a single thylakoid. A granum, on the other hand, is a stack. So it's an entire stack of thylakoids. And then lastly, stroma. This is the space kind of in between. It just looks like air in this picture. But this is where the Kelvin cycle takes place, which is a really important process of photosynthesis. All right, so there are two reactions to photosynthesis, something known as the light dependent and the light independent, which is also often called the Kelvin cycle. So the light dependent is just that. It depends on light. Light has to strike the chlorophyll, Water also enters the chloroplast, and then oxygen is produced here, which is actually a byproduct. We sometimes, as humans, we selfishly think that plants do photosynthesis for us to make oxygen, but in reality, they do it to make food for themselves in the form of glucose, and oxygen just happens to be a byproduct. Something else, though, super important is made here, and that is NADPH and ATP. Those two things are what's going to power the Kelvin cycle. So the Kelvin cycle, or the light independent, is what is done without the absence of light. So light is no longer an energy source here, which is where the ATP and NADPH come in. So they provide the energy for this process to happen. CO2 is also going to enter the stroma here, which remember that's the space, and then the Kelvin cycle ultimately results in the formation of glucose. So within photosynthesis, there are two photosystems that work together as part of the light reaction. So you can pause it here maybe and kind of follow the little orange electron. That's showing you how it's moving. So it goes from the water splitting photosystem into the NADPH producing photosystem which is how we're ultimately gonna get that energy to power the dark reactions. And don't stress too much about this diagram. We will spend a significant amount of time in class going over the two photosystems. So the electron transport chains then are involved with those photosystems and that's what transfers that light energy into something that can be used by the plant. So the electrons get excited as they move and this is how we get that ATP and NADPH. So remember, ATP and NADPH are powering the light independent reactions. Here's also a closer look at the Kelvin cycle. So we talked about how CO2 comes in here. That's what ultimately gets converted to glucose. And don't stress too much, I'm not gonna make you memorize this diagram by any means but I would like you to see just how elaborate the process actually is. So it shows three CO2s entering here at the top. You show the use of ATP, so ATP is being used there, the use of NADPH, and then you also see the ultimate form back to cycle again. And we have more ATP released as well. So it's really important just that you understand that the Kelvin cycle is a very complex process, but the ultimate takeaway point here is ATP and NADPH power it, CO2 is reduced to glucose. All right, so now we talked about 
photosynthesis, let's get into cell respiration. We tend to focus on animal cells when we talk about cell respiration, but plant cells have mitochondria, so they also can do cell respiration. This is where glucose is broken down to produce energy. And we have a formula here. Again, it's similar, but it's opposite. So we start with O2 to C6H12O6. That goes into or yields water, carbon dioxide, and 38 ATP. So we're creating ATP in the cell respiration process. So before we get too far, I do want to touch briefly on two important terms. So oxidation and reduction. And this is talking about the loss or gain of electrons, but also the removal or addition of hydrogen ions. So you may be wondering why I have a lion up here, but this is a really easy way to remember the difference. So loss of electrons is oxidation. So Leo, the lion that you see, goes grr. I know, super, super fancy, grr. Gain of electrons is reduction. So Leo, loss of electrons, oxidation, GER, gain of electrons, reduction. So that's a really easy way to keep those two straight. And as you see down here in this diagram, we have our glucose gets oxidized to the 6CO2 when H is removed. And then we have our oxygen getting reduced to H2O with the addition of H. All right, so we've talked about ATP quite a bit. Let's break down ATP a little bit. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, so ATP. Well, what it's made of is adenine, ribose, and three phosphates. So keep that in mind because we're also going to hear a DP, which means diphosphate or just two phosphates. And ATP is the source of all energy for the cell. So cell energy comes from ATP. And when that phosphate group breaks off, that's how energy is released. And we get that ADP molecule, which has no energy. It's not of use to the cell until it functions as ATP again. All right, so cell respiration. There are three major steps that we're going to talk about. And each of them, we're going to talk about our total ATP count because when we're doing cell respiration, we're doing this to make ATP or energy for the cell, so we want to keep track of how much we make along the way. Well, the process of glycolysis uses two ATP just to get started. So two ATP have to be put in for this process to work. And what it does is it breaks glucose into two molecules of something called pyruvate. It produces four ATP, so that's pretty good, right? But it's actually only a net of two because we had to use two so we made four but two of those four have to go back to start it again for the next glucose molecule because when you eat something you're not just eating like oh, i'm gonna eat one glucose molecule right you're eating a meal a food item with multiple glucose molecules so it's going to take multiple rounds of glycolysis to get energy from your food all right now the next step is krebs cycle and this is really important to note that oxygen must be present for this to happen, okay? So if oxygen is not here, it goes into something else, which we'll talk about after we talk about the aerobic version of cell respiration, okay? So oxygen must be present for Krebs. It's going to enter, and then that pyruvate's going to cycle through, releasing CO2, that's what we breathe out, right, and to ATP. So we made two ATP in glycolysis, we made two in Krebs, so our total ATP count at this point is four. So we have four, but if you remember that formula, that formula had 38. All right, so on to electron transport chain. So we have our four ATP, now hydrogen ions, so those super important hydrogen ions are pumped across the membrane. The electron transport chain is located in the membrane, and this pumping is creating 34 ATP, which is also releasing water. So now our total ATP count is up to 38 ATP. So electrons, right? We've talked about them. We've talked about hydrogen, hydrogen ions. It's important to note 
that electrons move as part of a hydrogen ion. They don't move alone. So the whole purpose of the previous two steps to before we get to the electron transport chain, so glycolysis and Krebs cycle, is to make these molecules that contain those electrons that power that electron transport chain. So here's an overview of just the electron transport chain. And this is the membrane of the mitochondria where you see this taking place. And once again, we will spend a significant amount of time in class going over how this functions and how the electrons move. Unfortunately, the electron transport chain can also have some issues. So certain poisons can actually block the formation of ATP at certain points in the electron transport chain. So that's why people can sometimes die, for example, from carbon monoxide poisoning because you can no longer make the energy you need for your body to function. All right, so we just finished talking about aerobic, meaning in the presence of oxygen. But what happens if oxygen isn't present? What happens if you're sprinting or you're doing some power lifting and you're not breathing normally and your cells aren't getting the oxygen they need? Well, in this situation, you would move to fermentation. Your cells move to fermentation. And the whole purpose of this is to regenerate that NAD plus that can ultimately power glycolysis and hopefully get aerobic respiration rolling as soon as you start breathing normally. So we still have glycolysis, but now if no oxygen is present, we go to fermentation. And there's two types. So it depends on what type of organism you are, and that depends on the type that you do. So alcohol fermentation is only bacteria and yeast cells. This is how we have beer and wine and cheeses and breads that rise. All of this is from alcohol fermentation. Lactic acid fermentation, on the other hand, is what animal cells do. So if you've ever had like lactic acid, lactic acid buildup in your muscles and they're sore, it's probably because you were doing some sort of anaerobic activity. Last but not least, I want to bring it back together with the connections. So this first formula you should recognize as photosynthesis, but it looks a lot like the cell respiration formula, right? Except they're opposite. And the reason why they look so similar and they are so similar is because they're interconnected. So the products or what comes out of photosynthesis is the reactants of cell respiration. And then the products of cell respiration are the reactants of photosynthesis. So really, really important that you know they are very interconnected. Once again, this is something we will definitely get more into during class. All right, and that was your brief overview of photosynthesis and cell respiration.